Okay, let's uh, begin. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Good afternoon, Vinit, uh, and participants in today's uh, online session. Uh, today's uh, session is on uh, impact investment, impact investing in the new mainstream. You know, we're going to talk about uh, what is impact investing. Uh, to tell us all about impact investing, we have uh, a very eminent personality by the name of Vinit Rai. Vinit Rai is the CEO and MD of Avishkar Venture Capital. He has over 17 years of experience in early stage investing, small business incubation, and microfinance. You know, so he's got a variety and a broad experience of almost everything that has to do with uh, uh, with investment. But then now we have we are talking about impact investing. So Vinit, kindly explain the landscape of uh, impact invest investing and how is it different from the other investments that we not people normally associate with. Yeah, so let me start with the Namaskar. Uh, in the post-COVID times, this is probably uh, the best way to start any session. So uh, I think I'll take a few minutes to take you through the developmental history of uh, India from my point of view or how I have seen it. Uh, Post-independence, uh, we, I mean, everybody realized that uh, we are a struggling country with a, a large number of people who are very poor. Uh, and uh, given that our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, had inspired so many people to try to work for the poor and engage with them, the spirit of development was largely driven by the idea of creating a self-sustaining village entity. So Khadi, Charkha, trying to actually... Uh, so sustainability and village level was one of the core areas. I think the most interesting part was there was a very strong belief of making sacrifice to make things happen. So it was a very sacrifice driven, uh, sustainability driven and a very important uh, uh, engagement that was largely to make India a better country and make, a, make it a better country for its own people. That's how we started. I think uh, uh, over time, we started urbanizing and there are new kinds of developmental movements started taking place. Some of you would have heard of uh, Self-Employed Women Association or SEVA. Uh, you might think about it as an NGO, but it's a trade union. And this was actually an early movement as Ur India urbanized that uh, uh, Ilabin saw that a lot of uh, roadside vendors were not treated well. They were not part of the economic activity. And she brought them together to create an urban uh, uh, trade union, which over a period of time has become one of the most powerful names in the global development uh, uh, evolution as well. Now, uh, around the same time when Seva and others was taking place, a gentleman in Bangladesh called Professor Yunus was trying to experiment with creating economic engagement uh, with the poor, which later on became microfinance and became very successful. Uh, as the Gandhian movement of development went on, there was a young man called Vijay Mahajan uh, who emerged in India, who started thinking about taking this idea of self-sustaining villages and the sacrificial way of development a little forward and tried to professionalize it and launched on a very famous NGO called Pradhan, uh, which I think could probably today be known as the first NGO that professionalized the not-for-profit sector. Now, the idea behind Pradhan was, can you take technology and this selflessness of human beings so taking a lot of talent and technology to rural India to train and transform it. And as Pradhan scaled up and as Vijay Mahajan, Deep Joshi and many others who joined them uh, started learning, Vijay Mahajan realized that uh, the economic activity, the financial role of uh, bringing about a change in the lives of uh, poor is as strong or probably more strong than the need for technology and the sacrificial uh, selfless thought process that is there. Uh, and around that time, he created basics, which is a little more advanced than just pure microfinance, uh, as you know it. Uh, uh, so microfinance is actually about five women coming together and trying to uh, stand guaranteed to each other. And the institution that actually does microfinance gives loans to an individual. So the loan is given to an individual. The guarantee is given by uh, all the women. At the same time, there was a gentleman called Al, Myra, Al, Al Fernandez who was trying to who was running an institution called Myrada. He, in partnership with Nabad, came up with a new concept called self help group, which was essentially an Indian model of microfinance, where the women, so banks' challenge was that they were not able to open bank accounts for an individual woman because they were too small. 
And uh, Al came up with the idea that you can put all these women together and form a group, and the group can open an account. And that became the famous, now famous self-help group movement, where the women, the group opens an account, and the group gets the money, and then the group decides to give the loan to the individual. So it's very interesting and different. They are all actually money being going to the poor people, but very different mechanisms in society. All this was very active. Uh, in 2000, early 2000. In 2001, uh, there are two people, one in India, that is me, Vinith Rai, and a lady in uh, uh, New York called Jacqueline Novogratz. Two of us started chasing the idea of using capital uh, in trying to make a difference to the lives of the people by creating jobs, livelihoods, or reducing risk and vulnerability in their lives. Through the harnessing of the entrepreneurial zeal of an individual. So the difference was that we were not trying to be sacri make sacrifice and help the individual. We were trying to create businesses that will try to create jobs, livelihoods, or reduce risk and vulnerabilities. The critical difference between the Indian approach, that was the Avishkar approach, is we chose to attract commercial capital and convince the capital that we can generate returns for you. While Jacqueline said, we will take philanthropic capital and demonstrate that sustainable enterprises can be created. Uh, this is how impact investing started. It started simultaneously in India and New York. Uh, even though Jacqueline also, Acumen Fund also chose to invest in India, Pakistan, and Kenya as their destination, we were focused only in India. Uh, between 2001 and 2010, uh, a lot of experiment success failure happened. Uh, there was another key critical distinct, uh, distinction. I started Avishkar with $100, while uh, Jacqueline, uh, because they were in a developed society, started with $20 million. So that was another critical difference. Uh, we, around 2008, uh, 2007, the term impact investing was coined. 10 of us actually met in Bellagio, sponsored by Rockefeller Foundation, and decided to call ourselves as impact investors. Now, the big question is, who is an impact investor? The definition goes like this. If you are a gentleman or a lady who wants to start uh, running a fund uh, where you go and convince people to give you money so that you would invest this money in the idea of creating business that make impact and also deliver returns, then you are an impact investor. It's as simple as that. Uh, that intention has to be up for, upfront that you will make an investment and generate return. And uh, the second is you will actually be open to be measured about the claims that you're making on the idea of impact. So that's what impact investing is. Uh, as we stand today, the claim is that uh, we are half a trillion dollar uh, in total impact investing across the globe. Uh, I have a very strong view that we are not half a trillion dollar. A lot of uh, what you call uh, old wine in new bottle has happened. So a lot of what was happening being earlier has been put into the impact investing bottle and is being sold. Uh, nevertheless, the world accepts it's half a trillion and it's a very good thing for us. So that's what impact investing is. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So I hope uh, participants have got a insight into uh, what is uh, impact investment. It refers to investment made into companies, organizations, funds with the intention to generate measurable benef beneficial social and environmental impact. And I think um, that's what... Uh, Beneath has, uh, uh, you know, very, very elaborately explained to us. So uh, moving forward, I would want to know from you, uh, Vineet, uh, you know, I, I came across this article in Forbes, which said the title was uh, Forrester to turned into a financier. Why, why did <laughs> Forbes uh, call you that? So I'm actually a trained forester. I used to live in a forest. That's how I started. Uh, uh, I spent three and a half years in a forest in Orissa. Uh, I passed out from an institute called an Institute of Forest Management. Uh, so my job was actually to hang on trees uh, and behave like a Tarzan. But uh, then I got married and my wife Swati actually didn't find that lifestyle as enchanting as I did. So I was given a very short window to find an alternate job. Uh, I was, this is 1997. I was in a forest. Uh, finding a job is impossible. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Also, forget about giving me a job. So, with great difficulty, I found a research assistant, research association role in IIM Ahmedabad. And uh, six thousand rupees as salary. I left everything and joined IIM Ahmedabad. Nine months of writing papers. I realized I'm not cut out for doing.
doing that. So I quit and uh, I was leaving when I was told that government of Gujarat is thinking about setting up India's first incubator. Now, 1997 uh, incubator, none of us had ever heard the word incubator. Uh, I was asked uh, to apply for a position. I applied for a manager, but uh, was appointed the CEO. So at 26 years of age, I was running India's first incubator, uh, rural incubator for sure, uh, and uh, reporting uh, right up to the chief minister. So had a very good, interesting four years uh, trying to convert farmers' ideas into businesses. Uh, I was successful with seven uh, unique ideas that I actually launched. Uh, in those four years, I realized that there is a need for both capital and talent. Uh, I also realized there is almost no capital available. No bank is willing to lend to a business that is going to start. No venture capitalist will ever come. And that's where the idea of starting a fund that will invest in rural India to bring it about a difference started. And that's how Vishka started. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> That was very good, Vinit. Yeah, excellent. And I think uh, hats off to you. You know, from from where you uh, you know you reached great heights. Uh, so uh, congratulations to you, uh, sir. So, uh, Vinit, it is said adversity opens new doors of opportunity, and uh, you know we are in a situation right now uh, where you know where everything looks uh, different. Everything what is the new normal? We don't know. And will the new normal bring the old normal? Also, we don't know. So how is this uh, shift? from uh, happening going to happen, I mean, uh, can you enlighten the various kinds of opportunities that COVID-19 will create for impact investors? <laughs> so first and foremost, I think uh, we all have to acknowledge that uh, COVID-19 is disrupting and disturbing us as nothing has ever uh, since the time human beings have existed. So. This is incredible. Uh, what we are going through is unheard of, uh, unthought of. When did anybody imagine? Probably when one can say Contagion uh, released, the book released in 1995 and the movie 2011 uh, did talk about it. Uh, 2015, Bill Gates talked about uh, similar kind of risk. But uh, I don't think so humanly any of us ever thought that we would be in a situation where we would be cooped up in a house or in a room uh, with no country open, no borders open. But not even districts, states refusing to accept their own people back, countries refusing to allow their own people fly back. It's just amazing what we are going through. Uh, any massive disruption will cause uh, new things to happen, new changes to happen. Uh, do I have uh, the best insight on what will happen? Uh, I would be very hesitant to say uh, that I have the greatest insight. But what I can surely say is uh, the fear that is there uh, would make certain behaviors change. And uh, those behaviors would lead to uh, better acknowledgement that we as, and this is not about just India, it's the whole of humanity worldwide, has probably not taken the idea of health uh, as seriously, given the kind of developments we have seen uh, and the kind of lives we live. Uh, our focus on health, especially when a pandemic like uh, COVID takes place, uh, our ability to deal with it is almost not there. Uh, one of the reasons why human beings have survived for so long and it's, uh, still yeah. continue to thrive is because we are very adaptable. And I think so human beings, in order to adapt, will try to change the economic cycle that we are dealing with. Now, how successful we are uh, and how long the fear of COVID pandemic persist would define that change significance in depth. Uh, for sure, I think uh, what remarkably has changed is that your digital transformation in your business is now a critical and key aspect. Uh, I think uh, going through work for home, uh, and in my view, therefore, the industry, uh, which is especially about space uh, and uh, about real estate, is going to really struggle to come back because uh, uh, suddenly, I think all of us have discovered that you can work from home. Uh, I think the oil industry, uh, the energy industry will also dramatically change. We might actually have to, they might have to, those who are dependent on it may have to rethink how they are going to survive and scale up. Uh, for sure, countries like India will rejoice with that. Uh, but uh, uh, the industries that probably will rejoice the most are those who are in uh, long distance delivery. So those who are in e-commerce, those who are in delivery, those who are in uh, healthcare, but healthcare where they are able to actually come up with uh, 
thoughtful and long gestation investments uh, they might actually do well i think the fintechs even though they will take in the short run big hits uh, might see their businesses evolve uh, i think those who are in non banking finance sectors banking sectors might have to actually rejig and rethink how they have to going to work forward uh, i think companies like eps itself might have to both look at uh, reinventing and at the same time finding various different ways of uh, rewarding uh, or supporting uh, the changed population uh, i think the world is going to change uh, significantly whether it will change in a short period of time or will it change uh, sustainably over a longer period of time uh, remain a case of making conjectures uh, what i can surely say is the world of money will change quite dramatically uh, i and my personal belief is that there will be a significant focus on sustainability and survival rather than the ubiquitous thought of making more money out of less investment so right now we try to make as much as possible leaving nothing for everybody else i think we might have to go back to nature and see how tribals live in the forest uh, you are extractive you take things out but you take things out that is due to you and not take things out that is uh, you don't take everything out right now the human beings greed pushes us whether it is a company whether it is an investor to take everything out and i think that extractive behavior the desire to not live in harmony with nature uh, i think that will change quite dramatically it's true true that's correct yeah <clears throat> so uh, you know we we, we had uh, dr uh, mr uh, gandhi r gandhi who the rbi ex deputy governor i don't know whether you did uh, had the opportunity to watch that session and he talked about uh, you know we have talked about the gen next you know and he said the gen next must not look focus much on employment but look up at startups and becoming entrepreneurship you know that's what uh, he said become more of startups and become more of entrepreneurs than trying to look for jobs in the in the new world so i i was going through avishka's uh, website and i was impressed with the two letters that two words you put in nurturing entrepreneurship this is so relevant today right so i hope that uh, uh, you know uh, there are more many more people young gen can uh take advantage of uh, the uh the company uh from my uh, impact investment so uh, another point i had uh, here out here with it was that you have been at the heart of impact investing business how does the world compare the impacting investing versus the traditional models of investments i think uh, uh it's very difficult to find a business that does not make impact uh every business makes impact so then the big question is if every business makes impact then what is the difference between investing and impact investing because those both sound the same just with a new level and a new prefix i think uh, the critical difference of the idea behind impact investing was that uh, there is a need for the world the philanthropic capital that is there to support poor people is very limited now this poor, this pool is limited and this pool needs to be used for the most pressing needs which business cannot yeah. solve but then there are lots of businesses that actually make significant impact uh, they require a different kind of capital they cannot be they cannot meet the risk reward uh, relationship that mainstream capital looks for and therefore a new kind of capital is needed which has to and this was my belief should pull in the 2 200 trillion dollar of mainstream capital not the 100 billion 200 billion dollar of philanthropic capital but should pull from the 200 trillion dollar of mainstream capital convince them that there is a risk reward opportunity here where you not only bring the 3 billion people living in the base of the pyramid worldwide into the mainstream uh, it also as actually very money creator that means it will create returns uh, what you have to be very conscious about because you are dealing with low income population we are dealing with poor people you need to be very yeah. aware your equation and how you deal with them so there are extra ex- so this is not just about doing business it is about being bus- doing business in a very socially conscious and socially responsible manner and therefore your behavior cannot be exactly like a mainstream business now this is this is the whole theory so when you come become an impact investor uh, it's not that i'm trying to make less return and i think a lot of people think about 
there is always a risk reward arbitrage and the risk return arbitrage as well uh, but there is also a mission driven uh, returns versus general returns my personal belief is when impact investing goes and makes an investment it is trying to invest in an entrepreneur who is trying to solve a problem that probably has not been solved like trying to make money out of waste trying to actually provide water clean drinking water to poor people and yet making money out of it but providing that water in a very affordable at a very low cost price or solving any other problem like microfinance did how do you actually bank the poor in a manner that uh, they are included at the same time they are not really being charged a usurious price so the important thing in impact investing is you have to hold yourself accountable and you have to measure what you are doing and keep correcting in case you are not correct and uh, if you are just doing a traditional investment then you put in money and you expect significant returns uh, if the economy actually supports you in our case you are fighting against the economy you are fighting against the lack of ecosystem you are fighting against lack of education you are probably operating in the lowest strata with the lowest rate of the society which is also very sensitive to uh, rain water uh, anything uh, a cyclone uh, covid everything is impacted now the lucky part today is that uh, when we are doing impact investing covid 19 impacts everybody uh, fortunately impact investors invest largely in essential services we are trying to help people survive and live and therefore our businesses are operating while mainstream businesses are actually going kaput so somewhere i think uh, uh, the world has world conspires to balance uh, the two aspects true true very true so would you say that impact investment is more towards uh, to address social and environmental issues or not true Yeah, well, so the idea behind impact investing is to actually focus on those who are not seen as part of the economic pyramid. So if you go and so let's say if I am a traditional investor, I would look at say okay, so an entrepreneur comes to me. So an entrepreneur comes with an idea and say, hey, I want to actually make a car, or I want to send people to Mars. Let's say Mr. Yeah, yeah Mr. Musk comes to me and say that I want to send people to Mars. Mars, there are one five hundred or Two million very rich people in the world, uh, of which three hundred thousand want to go and live in Mars, and each one of them is willing to pay half a billion dollar. I'm just giving a theoretical. Yeah. I do calculation and I say, oh my God, this is actually a hundred billion dollar industry. Uh, he's a pioneer, and I'm going to make if I put in a billion dollar, I may actually get thirty billion dollar in return. That's how you do the calculation. Now, in my case, what you are coming forward is, hey, there are farmers; they don't know where to store their grains. Uh, these farmers are very poor uh, i would want to start a grain bank that will digitize every grain uh, every bag of grain that the farmer brings and in the process i will generate a 2% margin so i will do a very very difficult thing with very yeah. poor folks in a very difficult environment and generate 2% margin would you yeah. be willing to give me 10 million dollars now these are the two cases in front of you in the second case what you are trying to do is you are trying to solve a serious problem using human ingenuity entrepreneurial zeal to make a farmer receive significant returns and make his products produce far more viable than what it is using technology probably in this case like because we are digitizing yeah. it or anything else uh, and i think the the example examples i gave is the one example is also very path breaking risk taking sending people to mars is not a joke uh, yeah. it's very ambitious but it's only designed for the very few who are very rich yeah and when you go down to the digital bank it is extremely large opportunity very large number of people but to a very small margin and i think that's really would give you the context between mainstream investing in us absolutely wonderful thanks vinay that was great So uh, I'm I'm opening up for uh, participants' uh, questions now. So I have a couple of questions already. Uh, so let me ask you the first the first question, which says, Do you believe that the post COVID nineteen is going to have a brighter opportunities for the country, and how? What kind of investments can India look forward to? So uh, I, I can actually I'll I'll actually make a prophetic statement. I may be completely wrong, but take it take it. All. face value my belief is the following uh 
in the last 20 years of my own existence, we tried to actually set aside and say in the first 10 years that there is something called impact investing and that there is a need for people to invest to make a difference to the life of people. In last 10 to 20 years, uh, 2010 to 2020, we actually tried to showcase that we can actually deliver returns like mainstream. Uh, so we were sheep who were trying to act like a lion because everybody liked a lion. We were trying yeah. to behave like a lion. We talked like a lion, walked like a lion. Uh, we were trying to be mainstream. So impact investing was trying to look like somebody else and hoping and praying that it can get the money so that it can make a difference and prove a point. I think what COVID-19 has done is, is dramatically Alter, altered the thought process of the rich. And I'm actually saying it with some responsibility and some experience because I'm in talks across the globe with a large number of investors. A large number of investors who are not willing to talk to an Avishkar uh, as long back as two months back are suddenly willing to talk to us. And the reason they are willing to talk to us is not because uh, we have suddenly become better. It is simply that there is now a belief that the future belongs not to the lion, but to the lamb or the sheep. Uh, that, that is, impact investing is going to be the real way of creating. So now the next 10 years, the sheep is going to act like a sheep, walk like a sheep, duck like a sheep, and say, guys, there is a huge need to make the world a much more equilibrium place. There is a need for us to actually invest capital to make poor people come and become equal to you. There is a need for the world to become more sustainable. This idea is not new. 2015, the world came together to come up and sign an agreement called Sustainable Development Goals, wherein we believe there should be no poverty, no hunger, and no inequity by 2030. Now, that goal has been a marginal thought process in the minds of the real mainstream. In the next 10 years, this goal is going to be the key driver of the force, and therefore, impact is going to be the mainstream, and mainstream will become marginal. So if you are actually out there to just make money, uh, you have, you will, some of you will succeed, but there is a higher chances of you not getting funded. But if you yeah. have a mission, you have a missionary zeal, you have a thought process that you will change the world, and you have the belief that make, being rich is not the only goal, making the world a more equal place is your goal, you might actually do very well. Wow, that was very good, Avinit. Excellent, yeah. So I have a uh, you know uh, equally good question coming from Debashish Rai. He asks you a question: What is your opinion on rural entrepreneurship and role of impact investment to scale it up? Yeah, so, uh, see, entrepreneurship uh, cannot be dissected, bisected into sectors, rural or urban, uh, impact or otherwise. Entrepreneurship is essentially, and this is my personal definition of entrepreneurship is a person who essentially understands his or her limitations and excels within the boundaries drawn. So if you are actually somebody who sees an opportunity uh, in rural India and uh, you can convert this idea into a running business or a thriving business and you have the ability to scale, then a large number of investors will chase you. Uh, now, the critical question is, what kind of an entrepreneur are you? And there are very different kinds of entrepreneurs and these are not rural and urban. So if you are rural or urban, doesn't matter. A rural entrepreneur could be as ambitious as Dhirubhai Ambani and an urban entrepreneur could be as conservative as the next round uh, as a Kirana store owner. So if you want to actually become an entrepreneur, you have to ask yeah. yourself which path you want to choose. Do you want to control your destiny and you want to be the only decision maker? In that case, you have to depend on your friends and family and control your business, keep your business small, or scale it using the profits that you are getting. So when you scale it, you continue to stay in control. You don't depend on anybody else's money and you keep scaling up. If you want to rapidly scale, then you go to a venture capitalist who then becomes a part owner of your business. Not only does he become, he or she becomes a part owner of your business, they actually want to see an exit for themselves. Now that path is a very difficult path because not only are you bringing a person who right at the onset is claiming to be jumping off the ship or jumping off your train as the train starts speeding up because they have their own timelines. So you are creating some level of confusion in your train or in your engine or in your driver. And then you have to learn to deal with their rhythm while building your own business. Uh, and there, there are different kinds of people. So you can start with a venture capital fund or an impact investor. Then you can go to a private equity investor or a private equity 
impact investor. And then at some point of time, you have to go to a buyout, you have to sell your company, or you go and list yourself so that you can provide them an exit. The requirements of building a business of that kind is very different and ask for very different thought process. It does not matter whether you are a rural entrepreneur or you are an urban entrepreneur. It's the thinking behind the entrepreneurship that matters. Yes. If you are a rural entrepreneur today, whether it is Axel or Avishkar, we all will choose you. The reasons and motivations could be different. If you have an element of technology in what you are doing, you would actually have the ed tech guys, the ed tech guys, everybody will choose you. And so would the impact investor. I think that the world of impact investing and the mainstream investing is merging. And as I said in my last question, over the next 10 years, you will find it incredibly difficult to make a distinction between an impact investor and a mainstream investor. Not because impact investors are behaving like mainstream, but because mainstream investors will be forced to behave like impact investors. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, so uh, uh, I, while I have a few more questions on the q and I would also want uh, somebody from the participant can unmute and ask a question. Anybody? Uh, hello, KK. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, KK. I have a yeah, question for Vineet. Yeah, question for Vineet. Good afternoon, Vineet. Hi. Yeah, good afternoon. So the question here is, um, as, as we all know, and uh, your entire thing that you have shared so far is definitely inspirational. Uh, so quick question here. Uh, as we know that you have mastered in the social enterprise and in investing it for so many years, has this COVID-19 uh, scenario um, has changed your mindset in some way that you look forward, you know, uh, like this investment, impact investment in another skills, or uh, will you put or, you know, uh, all your plans or, uh, uh, you know, the upcoming thing more towards the prolonged investment sectors? I, I didn't hear it properly, but uh, my guess is you are saying, uh, has COVID-19 changed my mindset? And uh, would I continue to do what I was doing or would I actually do something different? Uh, yes, that's the question. Different yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, see, COVID-19 is just an, to me, frankly, it's just another obstacle. Uh, when I started with $100 in uh, 2001, uh, there was something called technology meltdown. Those who were not, were not very old, or who were not who were very young in 2001 may not remember, but it was also a doomsday scenario in 2001. Uh, in 2008, when the Lehman Brothers crisis happened, uh, it was again a doomsday scenario. In 2010, when Andhra Pradesh crisis happened, I had to write off $170 million, and I was an insignificant player at that time. To write off $170 million is a good opportunity to write for yourself. It happened to me in 2010. Uh, in 2017, when demonetization happened, we almost had the same kind of death wish, uh, very localized in India, but it happened. Uh, the pandemic in 2020 is actually just another reminder that how fragile life is and how important it is for you to actually do something that you want to do in making a difference. Uh, I don't think so a small pandemic should change uh, uh, somebody's uh, life goal. Uh, for sure, not mine. Uh, also, it has not changed anything from my past learning. I have seen uh, people dying in front of my eyes as early as 95, 96, 97. Uh, and I know how, how dependent and how unequal the world is. So if anything, it has actually just galvanized my belief uh, that over the next 10 years, a lot more support will come our way rather than a lot less support. And COVID-19 actually just resolves, strengthens our resolves to make a difference. So that's uh, while we did, that's true for uh, you know the local. Uh, what do you, how do you see uh, COVID uh, crisis reshaping the global economy? This is a, this is a slightly difficult and challenging one, but my my personal belief is that the uh, whatever little I have been hearing is that there is a very significant focus will come back on sustainability, climate change. And a large amount of changes will take place in the mainstream ecosystem. So, for example, oil will actually see a deflationary trend for a fairly long period of time. Uh, energy, the I mean, basically, electric uh, companies, electric uh, transportation might actually see a fairly significant resurgence all over the world. 
you would actually see a significant amount of support or investment going into the healthcare space simply because of the risks that are seen. Remember, some of the aging economies of the world are also the richer economies. So if you look at Japan, if you look at Singapore, if you look at uh, Western world, these are all aging economies. These are not young folks. It's the Asia and Africa, which are the young places. Uh, the rich economies would actually start investing significantly more in the idea and predictions of healthcare. And so there will be a significantly high investment that will go in. Uh, I think there's also a marginalization that will take place on the risk reward and return expectations. Uh, I think the world for next three years is going to see softening valuations. So entrepreneurs who are expecting a short gate to billion dollars uh, valuations will have to stay disappointed for a slightly longer period of time. Uh, in my view, capital will continue to be available, but it will be very much, it will be significantly competing. Uh, but if you have the right mission, right goals, and if you are trying to meet, make the world a more sustainable place, uh, entrepreneurs will attract significant capital on that side, rather than actually coming up with frivolous ideas that, uh, that, that at this point of time could actually generate significant returns. Uh, I mean, again, uh, hospitality, uh, entertainment, and other industries will continue to suffer for some time. That's uh, that's that's what it seems like to me. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great. Going on, uh, Sudhanshu, if you are, you can unmute and ask. Yeah, sure. Hi, Vinit. Thanks a lot uh, for for the insights into impact investing. As I understand from uh, what you've told us, not only has impact investing had an impact on the investee companies, but also on the investors because other investors are also likely to merge into impact investors, as you mentioned. Just wanted to understand what kind of returns do impact investors look at when they when they make an underwriting or a, a decision to invest under the impact investing schemes. So, uh, I would actually I will I will tell you something which uh, most people will find funny, but uh, I am a forester, not really an investor. So let me actually tell you the secret of the investors. Think about it. Uh, I, as a general practitioner or a general GP. Uh, who's basically effectively managing uh, other people's money. When I come to you and ask you what kind of returns will you offer me, and you, let's say, are a startup entrepreneur, and you come up with a theory and say, okay, I'm going to do this, to, and I'll go, to, go back to Elon Musk's theory of, I will send people to Mars, I will generate a rocket that can actually land, and so you give me money so that I can send people to Mars, and I'll make money. Now, if Elon Musk is successful, and if I am giving in the first $100 million, I would make billions and billions of dollars, right? If he is a failure, I'll make a zero. Theoretically, that's what the construct is. Whether you are an impact investor or you are just an investor, when you are doing investing into a vision of an entrepreneur, the returns actually are all theoretical. You make an Excel sheet and you create scenarios. Those scenarios can give all returns. They can give you negative returns and positive returns. Everything is based on assumptions. I can show you term sheets. Not a single investor who had a ter signed term sheet in February 2020 has signed and executed on that term sheet. Why? If they were so confident that they knew that they are going to get 25% return, why has COVID, a small thing, a one-month uh, pandemic should change your decision? Because their assumptions have been proven wrong. Investing is an art of believing in somebody. So when I actually make an investment, I make a, I make an alignment to the vision of the entrepreneur. I participate in that vision without actually putting in a lot of effort, but using the capital to help the entrepreneur's vision move forward. The entrepreneur's vision, if it is successful, might give ex ex exorbitant returns. It can give you 30, 50, 100, 200% return, or it may give me a 0% return. As a manager of a fund, you participate in 15 such ideas. Depending on the strategy that you are following, you expect some of them to succeed, some of them to fail. Let's assume for a minute, Avishkar's track record has been a 28% failure rate. Roughly translates into for every four investments I make, I lose one entrepreneur who gives me zero return. The other three entrepreneurs give me return. Some entrepreneurs give me 2% return, some give me 20% return, some may give me 90% return. 
on an average therefore my five investors on five invested companies would give me a returns that will range between 5% to 20% Uh, if I am very lucky, I will get towards twenty percent. If I am not lucky, I will end up with a five percent return. This happens to every investor, impact or not. So generally, when you try to make an investment, you look at whether the entrepreneur has a vision, whether the entrepreneur's idea has a market, is the market large or small, is the problem solvable, do I have the right kind of capital to support the entrepreneur, and then you make a decision. The returns is actually just a Tick mark. Frankly, none of us actually really believe in what we are saying. Uh, only time tells whether we are right or wrong. A slightly long-winded answer to a very simple question. I can say 20% to you or 15%, but that's not really a right answer. No, what I meant was, uh, what are the returns that the investors who are investing in an impact fund look at when they invest over here? So it's a very because I've been thing. in the private equity side on the real estate. For for ten twelve years before I came into uh, EPS. So it doesn't matter. This uh, the same guy who invests in private equity invests in us, uh, and I think the difference is we go for institutions in impact investing, which generally very rarely have we raised money from individuals. Uh, we normally ask. Uh, in fact, I used to go and say, okay, we'll give ten percent return. People refuse to give me money. Then I said, okay, I'll give you twelve percent return. People still refuse to give me money. So then I by that time. again as a forester i did not know initially uh, i did not know what returns i will get so i used to go and tell the investor you will give me money today i'll return the money in 10 years down the line uh, i am going to tell you what i will do with the money the outcome is neither in my hand nor in your hand so if you want 20% 40% or 5% doesn't matter to me you can write whatever you want the result will decide so the process will decide what the returns will be not what i and you decide So, uh, investing is actually an art of making impossible possible. It is not an art of committing a return. Uh, since you have been in private equity, you know for a fact that no private equity investor ever commits a return. Yeah, no, but the ex return expectations are different for different. It uh, does not matter. Does not matter. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, everybody has the same impact investor returns. Nobody actually comes and says, "I want five percent return." Everybody wants twenty percent. It changes with time, thanks, circumstances, Vinit. and what you do. Okay, thank you. Th thanks, Sudanshu. Thanks, uh, Vinit. That is a good answer. So let me come back, uh, bring you back to the uh, projects, and I think I I know you have a lot lo many projects to talk about, uh, but uh, I interested in uh, you know one of the very interesting projects you've done is what is called Ergos project because it's also technology enabled uh, marketplace, and then. Something uh, we would uh, think uh, we meet PS and all the parts in Surya about the project. So Ergos is actually so this is actually goes back to 2015. Uh, we were looking for somebody who has an idea to do something in the space of agriculture. Uh, i met these two young gentlemen who were trying who came from bihar they wanted to go back to bihar and uh, one of them was working for icic bank other was in bihar and they wanted to they have identified that the farmers struggle to find a place to store their grains because the entire uh, entire warehousing system in india is designed towards very large production so you will see warehouses of 25000 ton metric ton capacity 50000 metric ton capacity but in a village if a farmer is producing one uh, let's say uh, growing in one acre or half a acre or one bigha uh, they are actually going to produce something in quintals not really in tons uh, they don't have the capacity to actually go and uh, store it so they create something called uh, uh, usawal or something which is a very localized granary where you have 30 to 40% losses of grain now a country like india where a small poor farmer actually earns few thousand thousand rupees would you want to see 30 40% to production loss uh, and these guys therefore came up with this idea that they would actually go and create use policy advocacy done by nabard and others to create localized grains granaries or warehouses where the farmers can come and uh, put this but what they will do is digitize the whole in process of training so when a person comes in with rice uh, or paddy 
you have to they will actually identify a certain kind of paddy they will come up with time terms and conditions of what they will invert and assumption is in a district same kind of paddy is grown so if 95% uh, of paddy is like this 5% of impurity if you meet this criteria i will digitize your grain and i'll give you a pass book as if i have put this grain as as cash in the bank so since you are running eps you will understand this they wanted to create a banking system so when you go and deposit your cash when you go and ask for cash you don't get the same notes you get some other notes so everything becomes fungible these guys were trying to create a fungible greenery or warehousing system that can that is dispersed over hundreds of villages uh, and so we put in a small amount of investment and they over last 5 years have now built around 40 such warehouses each one of them digitized all the grain that is there and then you are able to interact and sell this grain forward in the process in 6 months time they have increased farmers income 1.3 to 1.5 times uh, prime minister was asking of doubling the farmer income over a period of 5 years my colleagues in ergos are continuously demonstrating through data a 1.3 to 1.5x increase every 6 months in farmers income and that that actually is the kind of impact that you can make by taking the kind of risk that we took in 2015 when we invested in an idea we have just followed through right in the covid times i think on the uh, on 30th of march or 5th of april we invested another 30 crores in this company and 35 crores in this company uh, because we believe that this kind of investment is covid proof it does not actually get risk by covid 19 you can actually make a huge impact uh, and to our surprise between last year uh, last year april and this year april during the lockdown this company has an 8x uh, higher incidence of farmers reaching out to it than it was last year april so uh, an incredible achievement uh, for the for kishore and praveen for the founders and uh, actually we are very happy and proud to be supporting something like this that makes a huge difference uh, to the farmers Yeah, I understand, Kumar. Um, thanks a lot for this extensive, elaborate answer. And um, I was there along with that, basically the team that basically Agos team. It, it was amazing to see those two gentlemen doing so well. And incidentally, I think I'm so happy to basically be part of your fund, Bharat Fund, which basically invested in that as well. Thank you. Uh, I am taking over because I think KK screen is frozen. His so bandwidth is basically blocked. Okay, I. Um, taking on from what any other other participants who have a question for mr uh, vinith and you can put your hands up or they can call you and there was a lady who was basically trying to ask some questions and uh, let me ask uh, his name is meena okay here it is meena sivan she says hyper locals are in demand in your words sheep they are sheep but they neither have funds to cater to the increased demands nor have the civil scores to finance how would you lender how would a lender evaluate them is there a need for new underwriting models that's a question well, i think yeah, yeah, absolutely in fact uh, uh, i personally believe that there is a lot more innovation needs to be done in lending the fact that today rbi is actually at its wits end to convince the banks to lend tells you that the underwriting models have actually reached uh, the end of their ability to be objective uh, the fact that banks have actually reverse repo has parked all their money back with rbi tells you that uh, there is a need to rethink and relook at uh, what businesses do and what they are not they will not be able to do uh, i think there are lots of innovations that are taking place fintech models are doing different kinds of innovations there are all kinds of uh, new ideas that are floating around our own company ashwa uh, which actually is uh, looking at granular lending is going and doing completely collateral free cash flow based lending uh, has actually been uh, continuously doing significant lending over last 8 9 10 years and over next 3 4 years we expect to actually increase it significantly but uh, the only thing that we are probably completely aligned on is uh, there is a need for rewriting uh, the lending models i mean we have to and how do you underwrite has to be rethought uh, and rethought quickly and speedily okay thank you thank you i, I hope meena basically just you know, got the answer right um 
my question in the way basically just you know you have gone through this uh, life as an um, investor as an entrepreneur and um, as an investor i think it's you know you are still an entrepreneur because you run an organization that you have to also be answerable to many things your investors your lps and so on and so forth and uh, kk i think i am just interjecting you i mean out of action for them kk you're there okay uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, my I'm, question I'm, to basically just you know when it was um you have a double role what is there an investor role and there is an entrepreneur role and you are answerable to both sides this side as well as that side so it's more complicated than basically a guy who runs an organization where he's answerable to the investors and of course he's answerable to his own employees as well and that is what basically just not in our cases because the number of employees are plenty in 400s and thousands in town times and we are answerable to every family of them and a situation like this where we are covid the family finds it very difficult to let loose their own employees to work go out do something because we need people on the field to work so those challenges are very different what is your advice to an entrepreneur is it hope which is important or it is just basically just you know economics which is important so once you become an entrepreneur i think you have to be an hopeless optimistic you can't be logical you have to be quite illogical in your thinking uh, so as an entrepreneur the first first instinct is it is possible uh, entrepreneurs don't think about risk they think about how to make what is risky uh, less I, i think they don't even think about making it less risky they want to make it happen and uh, when covid 19 has happened and the risks are paramount what you want to do is as a leader and i think there is a distinction between the entrepreneur risk and the desire and the zeal to actually make a difference versus the considerations that come being a leader especially a responsible leader uh, uh money i know you have 500 to 1000 employees we actually within the group have 7000 uh, and uh, so i completely understand and empathize with the challenge and as you rightly pointed out we operate in very remote parts and we have all the same risk that you are thinking about i think our first instinct is to protect protect to the extent possible and understand what the risk is so like anybody else we first went completely uh, shut down uh, as soon as we realized that we don't understand the risk in the last one month we have tried to understand and assess every part of the risk and then we started taking decisions on how to move forward to move forward you need to actually take care of the safety of your employees you have to do a top up of covid insurance so that if something goes wrong you are able to at least provide some level of security and something you have to mentally make a note that you are responsible for the life limb and any risk that goes to your employees and ultimately you have to also realize that as you walk into a very troublesome period where you are going to lose business you are going to lose uh, revenue you are going to lose bottom lines you are very responsible for your people and i actually went in very early in advising both all entrepreneurs publicly as well as privately that uh, if you let go a person during these times you are essentially asking the person to walk away from you having nowhere else to go so you are better off retaining people to the extent possible for the time being and if you have to cut down your cost cut down the cost in a manner that the top takes maximum hit and the bottom takes uh, bottom is preserved as much as possible rather than firing people uh, so uh, my general advice is as entrepreneurs our first instinct is to do to make everything possible but when you are faced with an unknown enemy something as invisible as covid uh, the responsible side of your personality should take over you should think and balance the risk of doing things but more importantly the risk is not to you but to the institution and to the institution uh, that actually is responsible for the individuals who work for you uh, i would then caution uh, or err on the side of caution and try to protect my folks and prepare myself well and when i go back to make things possible i should be prepared with the right arms and ammunition so that i can protect and fight for my folks and do not leave them unattended yeah thanks thanks vinay it was amazing thanks over to you kk yeah i think uh, narendra wanted to ask a question he raised his hand uh, narendra you are unmuted you want to ask question yeah uh, vinay good afternoon this is narendra here 
um my question is that the struggle for life versus livelihood will continue so how does the impact investment roadmap looks like so see uh, impact investment uh, roadmap actually will continue in the same manner as the struggle for life and livelihood will continue as i actually said and i mentioned it very categorically that i see us becoming the mainstream of the future and the reason we will become the mainstream of the future is because the focus on life and livelihood will be far higher than it was in the pre covid world in the pre covid world the belief was that jobs will get created but when you are losing 40% or 30% of all jobs in india in last one month i don't think so it could actually continue the way it has continued in the past uh, there will be a timeline that uh, the cycle will take there will be stress there will be challenges people will get upset and uh, impact investors will have to play their role in pushing further to those companies that could actually create significant livelihoods well thank you vinod okay thanks so abina uh, asked a question do you think that investments will dry out for custom businesses which are focused on say customer or data acquisition or a less making less profit making businesses will they lose out uh, i think she, one of the key questions that she asked was probably top line businesses uh, answer yeah. is yes yes the businesses that focus only on top line they will not get any capital so you will see a lot of businesses going bankrupt in very short period of time very soon if they don't if they are not sitting on significant amount of capital uh businesses that are actually low margin businesses most likely will survive uh, if they actually generate significant livelihoods they will continue to not receive capital by the way businesses with low margin even now don't receive capital so i don't think so nothing much will change but their importance will get acknowledged and you never know my belief is they might actually start seeing capital moving to them because if they are going to support significant livelihoods there would be actually a focus refocus on them uh that that would be my take so actually before i i i, I kind of lost uh, lost the connection there was a question from uh, someone saying that uh, the impact investment uh, investing is all about investing in the poor but he was very disappointed that the poor uh, did not do a good show when the uh, nickel licenses opened up or liquor shops opened up and he says are we safe in investing in such people yeah, well i think uh, uh, for some strange reason uh, we the people of middle class uh, actually think that poor are different or better than us i i don't know why i mean the poor is a human being like you and me it does exactly what you and i do so if you drink liquor why don't you actually want poor to drink liquor if you have joy why won't they have joy if you are indisciplined why won't they be indisciplined uh, i think uh, they have the same rights as you Absolutely. and me and they are exactly the same that you and i are so asking a poor who is actually already disenfranchised asking and expecting him or her to behave more is really actually putting too much asking too much and expecting too much from them in fact they should be expecting from us to be going to our banks taking out every extra penny that we have and give it to them and say hey guys uh, go and eat your food and uh, enjoy your life because uh, covid 19 does not differentiate between poor rich and middle class i agree completely agree there absolutely yeah great uh, so vinith uh, we have come to the end of our uh, presentation uh, some of the participants the participants did ask some uh, questions i'll try to answer or try to put it across to you vinith as much as possible perhaps uh, in this um, a network uh, break that i had i may have lost out a couple of questions i'm so sorry about it if i missed some of the questions i now hand over to money to uh, no, to fire to uh, wind up the show money yeah. thanks thanks a lot vinay for being here and um, being so basically just you know vocal about um and inspirational about your own journey and basically just you know to most of us who have seen you basically just you know as an inspirator and i heard you basically just for long and i get inspired every time i see you speak and thanks a lot i think that must have happened to most of the participants from epas and others Absolutely. and uh, who have been here and um, in fact the last statement was icing on the cake and you said basically just you know why uh, 
there was a queue or chaos when liquor shops have opened and you will be surprised it was uh, in hiranandani just opposite to my home there was a lane and you won't believe there was a, so much of a rush ruckus in the evening yesterday and the police came and basically gave lathi chai and all these guys are staying in hiranandani pavai okay let me tell you this they are not poor oh. people they are <laughs> poor people at all so i think and i go with you and i think is uh, yeah. as as uh, indisciplined as they are and in fact i think is let me tell you they are more emotional and uh, sensitive than we are we are not emotional we are not sensitive we are more professional and money making and they are very sensitive and emotional and with that thanks a lot for basically bringing it up and thanks you like to have you i think you're continuing this series uh, right next week as well on the same day kumar uh okay anyway yeah. i'm looking forward to basically seeing you next week on the same day and same yeah. time thank you and thank you, you have been here thanks a lot thank you lot thank, thank you, you. Thank you.